Well, good morning, RHC family. How are we doing this morning? Are we ready to worship the Lord on this Palm Sunday? Would you stand with us, sing, clap, and I need some help because my voice is giving out. <laughs> When I 
Came sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah.
the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measures that He should give His only Son to make a wretch's treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns His face away as wounds which mar the chosen one. Bring many sons to glory. My sin upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His time Lord, for that promise, and we just thank you for this Palm Sunday, Lord, where we can just remember just how good you are, God, and just the the promises that you always fulfill, Lord. So I just pray that um, with this sermon that you would just give us hearts and minds to just take in the the sermon, Lord, and that we would just um, continue to have humble hearts. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Navigating Rock Harbor. If you would like to join us in supporting Israel in their time of need, there are several funds on the RHC website Give tab that you can donate to. The IDF Family Support Fund provides support for the needs of the soldiers' families. The Bless Israel Fund provides for the needs of the soldiers and humanitarian aid in general. Support is provided in the name of Yeshua. RHC ladies, join us on April 11th at 6 p.m. for our next Something Beautiful Ladies Fellowship. Enjoy dinner, door prizes, and a message for ladies. The cost is $20. Please RSVP at the dock. Rock Harbor Academy, which is our school for kindergarten through sixth grade, is now enrolling for the fall of the upcoming school year. For more information, please visit their website at rockharboracademy.com. Here's what's coming up at the landing. Please visit their table outside at the dock for more information on any of these classes or events. 
Our Koinonia Adult Bible Class is starting a new study called 12 Heroes of Israel. This class meets each Sunday at 8 a.m. in the youth room. Right to Life Kern County is hosting two events in April, Walk for Life Kern County on April 13th and March for Life Sacramento on April 22nd. Full details are available in the bulletin. Next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday and we are projecting an increase in the number of visitors attending. We need your help to alleviate the overcrowding that may occur during the 10 a.m. service. We are asking that those who are able would attend the 8 a.m. or 12 p.m. services that day. Pastor Frank and Pastor David's classes will not be in session that day and will resume the following week. As normal, children's classes will be available during all three services. Please note that all events, classes, and Bible studies will be on break from March 25th through March 31st to give our members and staff a break and time to spend with family. Please check the bulletin for more detailed information about all events that take place at RHC. You can also visit our website, Instagram, or Facebook page. If you're a guest at Rock Harbor Church today, we are so glad that you chose to worship with us. If you're a first-time guest, please join us after service at the Pastor's Visitor's Reception Area, located at the front of the auditorium. Pastor Brandon would love to meet you, give you a gift, and spend a few moments answering any questions you might have about RHC. Thanks for navigating Rock Harbor with us, and we hope to see you all next week. Hey everybody, I wanted to let you know about our new ministry, Tip of the Spear. You might have seen the logo around Rock Harbor for the last few months and probably saw that it, that it had sponsored the uh, Israel Conference last November. Anyway, I have chosen this name to represent our media ministry because it describes our function. Uh, Tip of the Spear means the first to enter battle. And as you know, uh, Rock Harbor... Uh, our media ministry is the first to enter the battle of ideas out there on the internet and all the false beliefs and to contend for the faith and furthermore to be a watcher on the wall. We're all called to be a watcher on the wall and especially in the terms of prophecy, in terms of what's going on in the culture, we want to make sure that we're on the tip of the spear on all the issues so we can warn people about the dangers, the spiritual dangers that are out there. Furthermore, tip of the spear, as you know, as our church is, we teach from pillar to post. We teach from Genesis to Revelation, the whole counsel of God. And that's actually a term Paul used uh, in Acts chapter 20 to refer to being a watcher on the wall, is that they teach the whole counsel of God. And that's what we do. We don't shy away from passages. We don't shy away from certain books of the Bible. We teach all 66 books as it states. And so, as you know, that's what we're about. So, that's where the name comes from, that we're going to be the first in with the truth in the spiritual battle of ideas. Secondarily, Tip of the Spear is going to be run as a 501c3 separate from the church. Now, the church is, is its own 501c3, but Tip of the Spear will have its own entity. And the reason we're doing that is for risk management. Look, there's going to come a day where they're going to, they're going to claim what I say is hate speech, and you know that day is coming. And if they do, you're going to see lawsuits come our way. Well, if lawsuits do come our way in the future, I want them to sue Tip of the Spear rather than Rock Harbor Church. So this is a way of protecting the church from being sued. If they sue Tip of the Spear, fine, we can go bankrupt at Tip of the Spear. But man, if they sue Rock Harbor, they will deplete uh, our savings and everything that we have in order to pay our bills, to pay our debts, uh, in fighting you know, a legal lawsuit. So I don't want that happening. So we're gonna separate that out as a risk management issue. Thirdly, uh, having a separate entity with tip of the spear um, helps us with allocating resources. One of the things, as you guys know, we're different than most churches. Uh, we have a two-pronged approach. We have our local church, our Jerusalem, but then we have our Judea, Samaria, and the other ends of the earth, and that's through our media ministry. Uh, we are very different in that respect because we reach worldwide, and we have a large, large audience that actually contributes 
uh, to our ministry. Uh, I think the, the last time I looked, uh, they contributed about $1.5 million to our budget. And so it's a significant source uh, uh, of ministry for us. And so we, we want to make sure that we're devoting the right amount of, of employees, resources, and equipment to it. And so what ends up happening is as we continue to grow larger globally, uh, we're going to need more employees for it. We're going to need more staffing. We're going to need more resources. So what I decided to do is we start splitting that off from the church because if not, the ministry, the media ministry will start pulling the resources from the church. It will start pulling employees. It will start pulling uh, budget numbers and stuff over to it. And I don't want that to happen. And again, we're not at the size of like a David Jeremiah uh, that has a, you know, a separate entity uh, called Turning Point as opposed to Shadow Mountain um, or even like the late uh, Dr. Adrian Rogers who had a low worth finding versus his church which, which was Bellevue Baptist or even um, the late uh, Charles Stanley that had In Touch and then he ran First Baptist Atlanta. At some point, you have to separate the media ministry from the church because of the resource issue. Uh, again, like I said, we're not there yet, um, but we need to do it now. So when that time comes, we'll have a clean break and we won't be pulling resources from the church over. So anyway, good stuff happening, very exciting things that are happening. This, this is uh, what we call growing pains. Um, and the growing pains means that good things are happening, but we're having to change a few things, change a few things up so that we can meet the demands of what the Lord is doing for us. Because apparently the Lord just keeps opening doors for us and he's opening it not only here locally, but worldwide. So uh, we got to take this next step to ensure not only did we take care of our Jerusalem here locally, but we're able to reach Judea, Samaria, and the other ends of the earth.
what world am I in, man? Good night, nurse. It's crazy. And, and you think about, you know, what, what, what are people trying to do? And this is going to kind of dovetail into what we're going to study today, because I'm going to take a break from Genesis, and we're going to study um, Palm Sunday, obviously, the time when Jesus rode in on the donkey in Jerusalem. And, uh, you, know, it's, you, you know, the problem is that, that, that people have this notion of Palm Sunday that doesn't kind of square with what the biblical text is saying, and they call it the triumphal entry, uh, but it actually is, it should be termed something else. It, it should be presentation of the Lamb of God. Um, but the problem that Israel faced in that time is the same problem we're facing today. And let me explain this a little bit. Israel had no doubt a hopeful expectation of the coming Messiah and the accompanying kingdom that would come with him. And... Um, Unfortunately, it was not taught correctly. And, uh, and what ends up happening uh, is that the, the, the leaders of Israel, the rabbis, the Pharisees, um, created a, let me say, how, 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 how I want to do it. They borrowed from the biblical text the concept of the kingdom, but made it different than what the scriptures are actually saying about it. And, uh, and, and therefore, they do believe that Jesus is the Messiah, uh, the, the, the general population. That was not a problem. Uh, the religious leaders didn't. They had formally rejected him. But it's this notion of the kingdom which distorted the views of the people about Jesus. They, they, and again, I'm saying, they didn't deny that who Jesus was. They didn't understand the kingdom and the purpose of it. And, and, and so let me explain how this works, like, right now. People are being told that the globalists or, or Joe Biden or Klaus Schwab or the public schools or the college universities are telling people that we can create this utopian world. And uh, in this utopian world that we create, or it, that's their word for kingdom, okay? So just put... A utopia and kingdom synonymously, okay, in that. And that in this kingdom, we're going to make it the way we want it, and we're going to have justice, we're going to have fairness, we're going to have equality, equity, yada, 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 yada. We're going to eliminate all this junk, and we're going to create this. And in this kingdom, you are free to be who you want to be, okay? Now, you can do anything you want to do in this kingdom, but we're going to create it. And, and, and so whether it's like a communist utopia a Marxist socialistic uh, you know, type of utopia, or even a Christian nationalist utopia, right, where they're going to Christianize society by force. Um, or a caliphate, as an example. We're gonna, you know, Islam wants to create a caliphate. And so you have all these, these groups in our world that want to create a utopian society and say that we're going to create it, and this is how the reality is going to be. And in that reality, you can be free to be who you want to be, which is crazy. Really, all that is is a counterfeit of the real kingdom. And because in Israel's mind, they had this notion of a kingdom, which is true. That was partly true. But partly they were wrong about how it worked and that who was allowed into the kingdom and how you experience the kingdom and, and what would Messiah do with this kingdom. And, and because of that, they totally missed it. They missed the, the whole thing. And, and it's because of uh, the conspiracy of the religious leaders. And I think that's what we're having now with people today is we, we have leaders in our culture, and they've stationed themselves all through culture, you know, public schools, media, government, all that other stuff, and then the globalists as well. And they are... They are giving people a picture of a utopia that's not based in reality. So, for instance, I'll give you an example of uh, what I'm talking about. Hollywood has embraced this utopia, okay? And it's a woke utopia. It's a whore of Babylon utopia. And so every movie they make, like, bombs. Have you noticed that? Like, they don't make any money. No one goes to it. And it's just garbage if you do watch them. And there's always some type of 
uh, social agenda in there, you know, hypersexualizing the kids, uh, you know, making the kids gay and this and that, yada, yada, yada. There's always something going on in that. So people have had it. They don't go to the movies anymore. They don't watch the trash. I don't know, blame them. But uh, in the, the, the article in Breitbart made a, a good point that, like, they made three movies that are really, like, selling well, like the, the Ghostbusters, they brought the old guys back, uh, and then Dune, and then Kung Fu Panda. And you're like, what is the big deal? The big deal is these movies are making a lot of money. Why? Because they're normal. I know that sounds weird, but because they're normal. Like, you can go... Get your popcorn and sit there and watch Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray just be Ghostbusters and not have some type of, there's a lesbian, there's a transgender, there's a social movement. It's just, I can check out for two hours and watch Ghostbusters. Okay, that's how movies used to be, right? And Escape from Reality, just for a little bit. Kung Fu Panda's the same way and Dune's the same way. And they're doing really well at the box office. But Hollywood doesn't get it because they have a utopian mindset. Everyone is going to uh, absorb this mindset, and we don't care if we slice our own necks at, at doing it, if we lose profits. Again, they're pushing a utopian uh, nightmare. Now, here's another utopian nightmare. This is coming from the green agenda. Save the planet. Uh, us breathing is putting poison into the air and causing global warming. And our, S our big SUVs we're driving with our V8s are causing a catastrophe, a, a climate Armageddon. How dare you, you, you Americans drive your big SUVs, they say, as, as they fly off in their jets to Davos, <laughs> right? So what are they doing with this, this utopia? In their mindset, we're going to create a climate utopia, save us all from Armageddon, and so we're going to destroy the farming. Yeah, so big 140,000 farms lost in the last five years, uh, and, and, and so what happens? Uh, well, we, farming uh, is a threat to the planet because farming produces methane, especially the flatulence from the animals. And so the animals have so much flatulence, Brandon, don't you understand, that we cannot eat meat anymore. We have to eat bugs and junk like that. And so in this utopia of saving the planet, that where everyone's going to be happy and, and Mother Earth won't die, Gaia, um, we're going to destroy farming. And if you destroy farming, then what will happen? Starvation. Oh, but yet that's the problem. Yeah, if I have starvation, I can control people with food. Thank you very much. But people buy into this junk. Ask the common a 12th grader that graduates from high school, hey, man, do you believe the planet is dying because of some poisonous thing that comes out of our, our mouths? Uh, they'll go, yeah, uh-huh. But, but the problem is, in fifth grade, you were taught that the, the trees absorb that, they give out oxygen, and carbon's actually good for the planet. How did it turn into a poison? I don't know. I guess, you know, that's what the scientists tell me, Brian, and they wear a tie. Okay, whatever. <laughs> so Jeff Bezos, of course, capitalizing on this because he's creating a utopia for himself, right? So he capitalizes, and so what does he do? He knows they're killing the farm, and so he starts going into fake food production, sinks $1 billion into fake food production. Hmm, I wonder why. Hmm. Then this, the collapse of cultural Christianity and the rise of cultural queerness. Now, here's the thing. This is another utopia that they've told our young people. They've told them, look, you can be anything you want, you can identify as anything you want. You have sex with anything you want. There's no restrictions, no age limits, nothing. Just this is the utopia we want to create for you. And in that utopia, that kingdom, you can have sex with anything you want. Okay? So guess what's happening? Because they're selling this utopia. A quarter of Gen Z identify. A quarter. That's 25% of them. I want you to see this. In comparison to what? Uh, they, they identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, genderqueer, and, and the other 52. While just a few years ago, less than 3% of the population identified as LGBT. Don't tell me that it's not working. It is. So the upcoming generation of Americans are increasingly views religious freedom as overt bigotry. That's why I, I created Tip of the Spear as a separate entity, because that's coming my way. We will be sued over religious bigotry when I come against the LGBT, and then it becomes a hate crime. 
That's what it's happening here. But again, what is the fantasy? Fantasy is this. We will create a utopia where you can have sex with anything you want to have sex with. Crazy, right? It'll destroy humanity. Then a part, a, a, the other part of the dystopia that they're creating is through AI. And, and, and it's the transhumanism AI. I mean, seriously, man, this is like, this is like the Terminator. This is like Star Wars. This is like Star Trek. I mean, all these sci-fi movies that you guys watched, it's happening with AI because they want to reach a, a transhumanism because in their utopia that they're creating, they want to live forever in their kingdom. And the only way they, they think they can live forever is to have AI and, 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 and them create parts in us like, like eventually you become like Darth Vader where like, you're half of a human, half of a cyborg, and then, then may, maybe when your body starts wearing out, we'll just download you to your clone uh, and, 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 or your clone parts that we've cloned you off of or whatever, or we can download your brain into a computer. Or right now, if you want, uh, Elon Musk says we can put a neural link in your head, and you can already start playing with the force already if you want to do this. I mean, it's total Star Wars stuff. But what is this? It's a utopia where you get to live forever. It's, it's suggesting immortality. That's a counterfeit. And then Elon Musk, which I wouldn't trust as far as I could throw this guy. I mean, I, I, I appreciate him being good on free speech. God bless him on that one. I, I appreciate that with Twitter and all what he did there. But dude, on the, on the same token, you, you turn the coin around and he's like all for surveillance. So he's putting all these satellites in the air and, 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 and they're selling us, this is going to be a good thing. It's going to be good for your security. This is good for you know, criminals and stuff like that. It will make you, your life more secure. Really? Because in that utopia, I lose my freedoms. Because then you see everything I'm doing. Well, Brandon, you shouldn't worry about it. If you're not up to anything, what should you worry about? That's not the issue. The issue is privacy. I have a right to privacy. But he didn't care. Because in the utopia that they're creating, everyone needs to be surveilled. Everyone. Oh, okay. Now, take about this. Now, even in our world, the Christian world, there's a lot of Christians that are missing information. And, um, and this, this is, again, goes to the point that if you don't know what the Bible says, you're going to misinterpret things as they did with Jesus. So, for instance... Uh, it's possible that, the red, one of the, that one of the red heifers that they have, or both of them, or whatever, how many they have uh, in Israel, is going to be sacrificed this year. Um, and again, they've been waiting for about two years, and they've got to find out if it, it has more than two hairs that are white or whatever, then it's uh, blemished. Well, apparently they're not, and they're, they're continuing. So it's very possible they will sacrifice the red heifers this year, possible, and then they'll have the ashes ready. And you're like, what is the big deal about that? Well, then that means that they, the Jews can consecrate the area in which they will build their temple. And, and you're thinking, okay, what's the big deal about that? Well, Christians, a lot of times, they, they get caught up in this and say, oh, this is great. This is great. This is great. Yeah, it's prophecy. They're, the Jews will rebuild their temple, but it's not sanctioned by God, according to Isaiah 66. And this, is be the, this will be the temple the Antichrist goes in and desecrates and proclaims himself to be God. We are not to support the building of a temple. Now, we, we recognize that they might do it, but we don't support it. So Christians start giving money to this. And it's like, no, 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 no. You're totally off. Do not give money to the tribulation temple. That's wrong. Yes, it will play itself out, but it doesn't mean I support that. Uh, that's a no-no. That's a but anyway, what's the point? The point is, if you have missing gaps in your information, you don't know the scriptures very well, then Satan can trick you into believing there's, there's this utopia that you can create. This will be an idyllic state. And, and, uh, and, and the problem is, you can even believe that God is allowing you to have this utopia. That's, that's where it starts getting really muddy. And that's what started happening to Israel. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to jump into the text with that thought in mind. And I want to show you how they mis misstrewed this and, and what it cost them, okay? So notice, this is Matthew 21, and it says this. Now, when they drew near Jerusalem 
and came to Baith Paga, which is, we, we pronounce that in English, Beth Page, but that's not how you pronounce it. It's Baith Paga. And I'll explain what the name means in just a second. At the Mount of Olives. Okay, so what's the date? The date is when Jesus does this, it's the 10th of Nisan, April 2nd, AD 30. So we have exactly the pinpoint date, okay, that he's going to enter Jerusalem. And th again, like I said, this is not the triumphal entry. It should not be termed that. He comes in riding on a donkey, and it is a presentation of the lamb for Passover, okay? So notice that it's uh, the 10th of Nisan, which is exactly, uh, uh, you know, when you're supposed to get your, your, your lamb for uh, Passover is the 10th of Nisan. Uh, Beth Page is about a mile away uh, from the Temple Mount. So you can see Beth Page, then the Mount of Olives, and then he comes down to the Temple Mount. Now, here's what the rabbis said. The rabbis knew that Zechariah chapter 9 predicted that Messiah would come in riding on a donkey. Okay? And uh, Matthew refers to this as well. But they didn't know like from what direction he would come in. And so they theorized he would come from the east, okay? And, and then they narrowed the focus, and according to rabbinic tradition, they uh, said he would come from Beth Page. Well, that's interesting. That's where Messiah starts that. So Messiah even condescends to keep even rabbinic tradition and he coming from that area. He condescends to do that, again, as a sign of who he really is. Anyway, what does Beth Page mean? Well, in, in Hebrew, it's Bayith Paga. Bayith means house, and Paga means unripe figs. And there's, that's a sign right there, that he, the Messiah is coming from the place of unripe figs. And the house is a reference to the house of Israel. And Israel cannot produce fruit because its fruit is unripe. It's the idea. So already, Messiah is sending a message that Israel is not ready for the kingdom. They cannot experience the blessing of the kingdom um, and, and produce fruit of there because something's missing here. Okay, so it already starts on a bad footing. Obviously, Exodus 12 talks about this, that on the 10th, on um, Passover, and this is a celebration, they're, they're celebrating this Passover, you are to select your lamb. And then what you would do is you would take that lamb home and inspect that lamb for four days and, and, and decide whether or not that lamb was able to be sacrificed. If it had a spot or a blemish on it, you couldn't. And so what will happen is Jesus will go into Jerusalem the last week, and John the Gospel really focuses a lot of attention on this because he's debating with four different groups in Jerusalem at the temple, and he's being questioned constantly. So by the time Wednesday rolls around, he has basically been examined by all religious groups in Jerusalem and has completed the examination of himself, him being the lamb. Okay? So the lamb is now ready to be sacrificed because the lamb is now unblemished. They couldn't trip him up. They couldn't figure out uh, how to get him in trouble with Rome. He, he didn't trip, uh, they tried to trip him up with a Mosaic law. They couldn't do that because he's the one who wrote it. And so at the end of the day, he left them dumbfounded. And here's the thing. They were supposed to declare the Messiah is the lamb of God that he's clean. And they refused to do it, didn't they? So guess what happens on Passover? You still have to have a declaration that the lamb is clean, don't you? So guess what happens? God says, fine, if you don't want to uh, say that he is uh, without spot and blemish, I'll use a pagan Gentile to do it. And guess who did that? Pilate. Three times I find no fault in this man. Three times he said it. So Paul, uh, sorry, Pilate declares Jesus to be the unblemished lamb. Oh, then Jesus set, sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village opposite of you. It's probably Bethany, by the way. And immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says 
anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. Now, I, commentators are, are debating on how this went down. It's probably Bethany, and Bethany is where he, he was friends with Lazarus and Mary and Martha, right? That's where Lazarus lived. And remember, just a few days before, he just raised Lazarus from the dead. So the buzz is going all over the place, all over Jerusalem. And you got to remember, Jerusalem has about 2 million people there for Passover. So everybody has heard that he has raised Lazarus from the dead. The religious leaders want him to be killed, but they can't do it because they're afraid of the crowds. Okay? So, so then he tells them, go find these donkeys. And um, again, fulfillment of, of Scripture. But again, we don't know if he prearranged this. We don't know if this is his omniscience as God saying this is what will happen. Or we don't know if this is like tradition. Because tradition had that you could, if you're a dignitary, ask for uh, someone's animal to borrow them. Like a donkey to ride on them. We don't know what this is. It could be, uh, it could be his de- uh, evidences of his deity. Regardless, there's something about the donkeys I want to show you. And he rides in on the donkeys in Jerusalem, not on a horse. Why? This is a fulfillment of prophecy, Zechariah chapter 9. Now, here's the interesting thing. I I want to do some history, just a a little bit. When Britain took over uh, Israel, or the area of Israel, after uh, the Ottoman Turks had it, they took over, and this is December 11th, 1917. Allenby, General Allenby, who was the head of the British uh, Army in that, and along with him was T.E. Lawrence, uh, and they uh, had taken Jerusalem, but Allenby, being a believer, he was riding his horse, and he got off of his horse because, because he said this, I won't ride my horse into the city in which my Lord rode a donkey. So even Allenby had enough respect for what Jesus had did and he walked in to Jerusalem when he, they took over Jerusalem. Interesting, this is a little history tidbit. But anyway, Matthew goes on and says, all of this was done that it might fulfill which was spoken by the prophet. The prophet is Zechariah, saying, tell the daughter of Zion. The daughter of Zion are the inhabitants of Jerusalem, primarily the religious leaders, okay? Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly, and sitting on a donkey, a colt, and the foal of a donkey. So, Messiah gets the two animals, right? But Zechariah says he's going to sit on the colt. He's going to sit on the, the baby uh, as he rides in. And the mother is going to accompany the colt with him as he rides in. So there's two donkeys in the story. Most movies portray it as one donkey. There's two donkeys. But he's riding on the colt. And I want, I'm going to tell you in just a bit why he does that. Okay. But now let's, let's turn our attention to what Zechariah's prophecy says. Notice what I have here. This is Zechariah's prophecy. But the green is what Matthew is quoting and saying is being fulfilled. And the yellow is yet to be fulfilled. Notice what Matthew is leaving out. He's leaving out the verse 9, rejoice greatly. Because this is not a time of rejoicing. Even though they're rejoicing, it is not a time of rejoicing. It is not. They have, the religious leaders have rejected him. Year one and a half, okay? They have formally said, he does works by the power of Beelzebub. And they committed the unpardonable sin or the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And now the nation is under judgment. So this is not a time of rejoicing, okay? That's, what, what, what's, that's why Matthew leaves that out. O daughter of Zion, the religious leaders, shout, O daughter of Zion. That's left out because this is not your salvation. This is your condemnation. Notice you you jump to verse 10 in yellow. It says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horses from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. What is that a reference to? Is that one day Messiah is going to have a disarmament of all the nations of the world, even Israel. Because when Messiah rules and reigns, it's a a reign of peace. They They will take their weapons and turn them into plowshares, right? There will be no more war when Messiah reigns. So Matthew keeps that out because that's not coming right now. And then he says, he shall speak peace to the nations, peace among the nations. That's, that's, that's the, the messianic reign, the kingdom. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So he'll be the king of all the earth. 
And so Matthew is intentionally leaving that out because Israel has rejected their Messiah. And so this prophecy, the 9 and 10, can't come to fruition. It is now being held off, and only this small verse is coming to fruition. So what does that mean? What Matthew leaves in is a message to Israel. And here's the message. He is the king of Israel, no doubt about that. He's the creator. How so? Because he controls the animal. He has authority over the animal as Messiah, and he's the second Adam. All that wrapped up in a donkey? Yes. Why? Because the donkey is a colt. It's a foal. It's not broken like its mom. So if you got on its back, it would have bucked you off. It would not, it's not uh, 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 compatible with somebody riding it because it hasn't been broken, which indicates when Messiah controls the animal, he is exerting the authority that Adam had over the animal kingdom. Remember, the animals were not against us. They were for us. You would have been able to go to a lion or a tiger or any of these things, and they would be friendly to you, and you could actually control them, and they would, they would work for you. That's how the Garden of Eden was like. The animals were, were subservient to us. Now Messiah is showing, I'm the second Adam, I'm the Messiah, I'm the creator, and I have an authority, and he calms down that little animal to where he can ride on the back of it. It is exact, exactly what he's trying to tell Israel, okay? That he is the second Adam, and he has to do the work of, uh, for the, uh, of the second Adam that the first Adam lost. Notice that he's without station and privilege. So basically, kings rode in on horses, but people of lowly stature rode on donkeys, okay? That means you didn't have much. We know that. The, the Son of Man had no place to lay his head. He's poor. He's humble. This is called the kenosis of the Messiah. That Jesus, being God, um, gave up the use of, his, uh, of his, his, his independent attributes of God and submitted them to the Father. So that when, when, when you saw deity come from Jesus, like through a miracle or whatever, it was done through the power of the Holy Spirit, not his own deity in his nature. It came from the nature of the, th the third person of the Trinity, and it was on command by the Father. So that's what we call the kenosis, the self-emptying of himself. He basically took on the additional nature and limited his independent use of his deity to the Father's will. That's what we call the kenosis theologically. So that's what he's doing here, okay? So he's coming humble as a servant. Furthermore, being on a donkey and the donkey symbolizing that this, this one is not going to fight back. If he was to ride a horse, it means he comes to war. In Revelation 19, how does Messiah come then? On a cherub horse to war. But he's coming on a donkey because he's not going to war. He will not fight back. He is going to be the suffering servant. Okay. He comes to save spiritually, but not bring peace among the nations. And this is what throws off the rabbis today. Because they conflate the two. They say, well, if a Messiah comes, he must have peace among the nations. And Jesus came, and he didn't bring peace among the nations. That's right. Because there's now two comings, we understand. And Israel wasn't ready to have the, the kingdom. They had denounced the kingdom religiously uh, uh, by the religious leaders. He is also pure without spot or blemish. The donkey is presenting him as the Lamb of God. They can't make any accusations against him. And this is what he will be tested for in the next four, year, uh, four days. The donkey represents servanthood. The donkey is a beast of burden, right? And so he's, 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 he's showing you his function right now that he will serve in a certain capacity as the Lamb of God. And then he shows his obedience. How so? Kings of Israel are forbidden to ride horses. They were forbidden to breed horses. And, and unfortunately, they did it. But Messiah, showing that he's obedient to the Mosaic law, rides a donkey. And then the last one is establishing a new entity. Now, this is what catches everybody. What do you mean establishing a new entity? How many donkeys are there? There's two. There's two donkeys. 
You have the mama, and he doesn't ride the mama, he rides the colt, okay? What is that? Well, we have been in Genesis, haven't we? And we learned that Jacob ended up having two wives, didn't we? Leah and then Rachel. And I said that Leah and Rachel represent the two entities that God is using to reach the world. Israel is Rachel. Leah is the church. Jacob represents the Messiah, right? The Messiah has two wives. There's two donkeys here. Which one is he writing? The cult. The cult is what? The new entity from the mama. You catch it? Who's the mama? The mama's Israel. The mama birthed the cult. Out of Israel comes the church because Israel rejects the Messiah. Christ says, I will build my church after that. So the new entity is the new ecclesia, the called out ones, which, which incorporates the remnant of Israel and the Gentiles into the same body. And that cult that he's writing, he's telling Israel, because you have rejected me, you are temporarily set aside, but I'm going to ride a new vehicle, the church, that I'm going to use now. And, and so it's a symbol symbolic way of saying Israel is going to be set aside. Not permanently, because they're going to be used again, but that's what the symbolism of the two donkeys meant. Now, here's the thing. That wasn't predicted in Zechariah. So, so this is being added as new revelation to the nation of Israel. And why? Uh, again, what it shows you is that God has given a bona fide offer to Israel, right? Right? He's given him an offer. You can have the kingdom. Here it is. But you must accept him on his terms and the way he wants it. You want this utopia. You want the kingdom that the, the prophets promised, right? Where the animals go back and eat straw. Where there's holiness and righteousness and Messiah rules and reigns over the nations. You want that? Yes. Then you must do it his way, not yours. Right? Right? Okay, so that's what he's trying to show, okay? Let's go back to the story. Watch how this unfolds. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and, and set him on them, set him on the clothes of the colt, okay? So they made it, the clothes like a saddle type of thing. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. So this is very ancient tradition uh, of a dignitary. You would put your cloaks there, basically saying, we are at your feet, we are here to serve you, and if you need us to stand and walk on us, we will do that, okay? That's how the crowds are, which is great. And so you want to tip your hat to this because the crowd does understand who he is. They just don't understand the function. That's the problem. They don't understand the function. They know who he is, but they don't understand the function of him right now. And again, this has all been set up because he raised Lazarus from the dead. So everybody's heard this. Right? Others cut down branches from trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Well, what's that? That is the messianic greeting. So the rabbis took Psalm 118, and they took a passage out of Psalm 118. It says, when the Messiah shows up, you must greet him with these words from Psalm 118, which is Hosanna or Hosanna. What does that mean? It means save us. Save us. But what sense is Psalm 118 talking about of saving? Because there's all kinds of salvations in the Bible. What do you mean? There's salvation uh, from uh, uh, enemies. There's salvation from judgment, physical judgment. Then there's eternal salvation. That's part of it. So which salvation are you referring to? Because you got to know what you're talking about if you under, you're going to understand Psalm 118. What kind of salvation? Phys, physical deliverance or spiritual deliverance? That right there is what Israel's not understanding. Okay? They don't understand the need for spiritual salvation. They want 
physical salvation from the Romans. Okay? That's what they're, and that little key right there, I'm not understanding Psalm 118. Because the religious leaders has twisted the concepts is what's fouling them up right now. They, they believe he's the Messiah, but they don't understand the concept of why do they need him? Why do they need Jesus? They think they need Jesus to get the Romans out of there. Oh, well, then you're missing it. You're totally missing it. Blessed is you who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Wait a second. You know when you would say that? You don't say that at Passover. You say that at, at Sukkot. You say that at the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles is in the fall. We're in the spring. You have Passover, unleavened bread, first, Feast of First Fruits, Pentecost. Then you go through the summer. And then you have trumpets, atonement, Yom Kippur. And then you have Tabernacles or Sukkot. You guys... Israel are wanting to celebrate tabernacles during Passover. You're really fouled up. That's like trying to say, we're going to have the 4th of July on December 25th. You're off. Well, how, how come you're so off? Because you don't understand the purpose of all of this. And when he had come to Jerusalem, all the city was moved saying, who is this? They know it's a rhetorical question, by the way. Um, they're, they're, they're really, it's a messianic claim. Who is this? It's got to be the Messiah, right? That's, what that's a rhetorical question. So the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of, uh, from Nazareth of Galilee. So they, they know where he's from. The problem is they don't even mention that he's from Bethlehem. He's actually, his origins are from Bethlehem because he's the Messiah. But they associate him to Nazareth, the place of rejection. And they should have caught that. Matthew does a sod interpretation and says he will be called a Nazarene. Now, that's a sod interpretation. A sod means that Matthew is doing a summary of all the prophets. And the summary of all the prophets is that he would be rejected. He comes from the area of rejection in the Galilean area. Nazareth is like the worst of the worst. Okay, it was, it was Hickville. It was, it was where, it's just the, the worst place you want to come from. And he comes from it. So they're not even picking up on this that, wait a second, he was rejected already. Your religious leaders have already rejected him. John adds to this. The next day, and all four gospels add to it. The next day, the great multitude that had come to the feast when they had heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out and meet, to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the king of Israel. They, they got it right. They got it right, king of Israel. They got it right. He is God. He is the Messiah. They got it. But what is this thing? Took branches of palm trees? What is that? That's Feast of Tabernacles. That's what that is. So if you go to Israel today, uh, the biggest uh, palm tree you'll see all around is the uh, date palm. That's the date palm. You probably, we see them here in Bakersfield, right? But Israel grows them in groves. You can see this is in the Dead Sea area. And they just grow them. And, and what they do is they harvest them for the dates. Now, here's the thing. If you're ever in Israel and you get a chance to eat a ripe date from one of these palms... It is the best date you'll ever have in the world, okay? The reason why, there's a reason for this. Because the area where they're grown, this is a little trivia fact for when you go on Jeopardy, um, you'll know this. Why, why does Israel grow the best dates in the world? Because they grow them next to the Dead Sea. Why? Well, the Dead Sea is 1,300 feet below sea level, okay? What's the big deal about that? Well, let me, let me give you an example, if you decided to sunbathe at the Dead Sea in the middle of summer, which is like 115 degrees, you would never burn. Do you know why? Because you're so below uh, the, the, the sea level, you're 1,300 feet, it's the lowest spot on the earth, the radiation from the sun doesn't reach that far. Ah, so what does that mean for plants? So the plants are not getting the radiation that we would get here like in California that damages the, the fruit and damages, because we, we, you know, even if you grow a grape, you can scorch the grape because it gets too hot because the leaves are supposed to cover the grape or whatever, whatever the fruit. In Israel, you don't have to worry about that because you're below sea level and the radiation from the sun never gets them. So that's why when you taste that, that date or the date syrup, 
it is like you have never tasted in your whole life. That's why it's called the land of milk and honey. The honey is the dates that's referring to, not bee honey, but it's the date honey. Oh, interesting. But let's go back to the palms. We, went, we tailed off a little bit. This is the lulav, okay? This is what you would wave at the Feast of Tabernacles. So you would grab a palm from one of the date palms in the area, and they grow all over the place. And, and, and you would wave this at Tabernacles, okay? Also in heaven, you see people waving palms in, 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 uh, in heaven, okay? What does palm symbolize? Well, the palm tree is called Tamar. There's like four characters, I think, in the Bible, uh, women's names are Tamar, right? And, and so you would wave this at the Feast of Tabernacles. And it represented, uh, obviously, the feast, but it joy. It represented the kingdom. It represented victory, triumph, peace, finally, spiritually, and a peace among the nations. And it represents, it represents eternal life. So that's why the palm is associated with the Feast of Tabernacles. It's the final of the feast. It's the end. It's the end, okay? And you would wave this. And so you would face the east, and you would wave it a couple times here. You face it that way. Face it this way, and then you wave it behind you when you celebrate. So they're doing this. They're using the lulav on Passover. And they're putting that down before him and waving these things. So they're off. So this is, the, this, this is Sukkot. And this is what you would do in your house. And when you celebrate Feast of Tabernacles, you would make a makeshift tabernacle, like a, a little fort, and you would put the palms all around it, right? And, and you would celebrate not only Israel living in the, the desert under, you know, uh, under the tents. And that's what it represented. But it also pointed forward to one day we're going to be in the kingdom. And we won't have to live in our tents anymore. We'll finally be permanent and established. Interesting thing about the palm. Um, I want you to look at the palm real closely. So this is a fake one, obviously, but it, 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 it serves the purpose. The palm branch is symbolic of a human being. Do you see the human in it? So this is the spine of the back, right? And these little fronds that come out are the hands of the worshiper. You see that? So that's why palms are used, because it shows you worship. The individual is worshiping in praise of God. So this idea of the palm branches and the spine of the human being, this would be a picture of a Hosanna, save us. That's what this looks like. It's Hosanna, save us. That's what the palm looks like. Every time you look at a palm, you'll see the spine and you'll see the arms in the air. It's symbolic of that. Okay. What happened? Dude, they're like totally off. And again, they would, they would march around the, the altar at tabernacles and say this, Hosanna, Hosanna, I beseech you, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech you, now send prosperity, send, you know, the kingdom. Totally off. What happened? Well, let's talk about it. Let's, let's talk about the conspiracy of the rulers. Because this will open our eyes to what's going on currently in our world today. Here's what the conspiracy of the rulers are selling. They are selling... A kingdom, which again is prophesied in scripture, but they do it with a twist. And here's how they're selling it. You guys want the kingdom, right? Yeah. So in every synagogue, they're saying, we want the kingdom. Amen. Right? And we believe the Messiah is coming. Amen. That's right, brother. You can just hear it in the synagogues. Because we want the, uh, the Messiah to come to get rid of the Romans. And if we can get rid of the Romans, guys, then Messiah can usher in the, the kingdom and we will have peace because the Romans are gone. Let me tell you that tactic. There's a little bit of truth mixed with error. How so? Because the, the rulers do it today. They oversimplify the problem and make the problem external to the people. Okay? 
Global warming, right? You catching the drift? An external problem or whatever, you know, capitalism, an external problem, right? Or whatever, uh, sexual freedom, external problem. So they cre- the leaders create an external problem and use the external problem as an excuse of all their problems, all of them, are labeled to one oversimplified issue, Rome. If we could get Rome out of our lives, then all your problems would be solved. That's a lie. That's a lie. Even if something is real, okay? Like if if I told you, hey, Joe Biden, that's the problem in the White House. Yeah, everyone would agree. That's a real problem. Rome was a real problem, right? But if I told you as a leader, hey, believe this. If we get Joe Biden out of there, Everything's going to be cake after this, man. It's going to be, it's going to be DreamWorks, man. It's going, to be, it's going to be paradise on earth once we get him out of office. Do you believe that? If you do, you're stupid. <laughs> right? If you believe any politician that says your problems are based on one external issue, you're, you're crazy. That's how leaders do it, though. Nazi Germany. What did Hitler say to the German people that was their problem? It's the Jews. One problem, oversimplified, demonized the one thing, and what did they do? Exterminate them. You see how it works? So the conspiracy of the rulers is nothing new. The Israel's rulers were doing this to the Israelites, and they kept telling them, look, Messiah comes, we're going to get rid of these Roman creeps. It was a real problem. I mean, no one wanted to pay taxes to Caesar. We would all agree. And we would all agree, Joe Biden is a problem. We would all agree, Klaus Schwab is a problem. We would all agree that Bill Gates is a problem, right? But let, if we just said, God, take Bill Gates out, take George Soros out, take, take Klaus Schwab out, is that going to change anything in your life? You catching the drift here? Oh, it's satanic to say that all your problems are external and based on one thing. That's crazy. That's crazy talk. So when they're seeing Jesus come in, Messiah, Messiah, save us. Save us from what? The Romans. But the spotless lamb is coming to save in another way. Right? Okay, so check this out. The conspiracy of the rulers. What the elites are doing today and what the elites did in Jesus' day, again, it's nothing new. It's here's the game. If I can deflect from what I'm doing by destroying your culture and what the religious people were doing by destroying the temple and destroying Judaism and the the people of Israel, the same thing. Uh, You know, Caiaphas, really, Caiaphas is Joe Biden, okay? That's how it is. If you can understand that, you can relate to that. Like, Joe Biden, everything he's doing, like, is, is anti-human, right? Caiaphas, same thing. What he was doing to the temple was just anti-Israel, anti-Jew. Caiaphas had done a deal with Rome. He was lockstep with Rome, man. That guy had sold out his whole nation for Roman money. That doesn't sound too different than what our politicians have sold out America for. They've sold us out to China. They sold us out to the World Economic Forum. They've done the same thing. Yes, right, nothing new under the sun. And what's the issue? Even if we got rid of them, your problem still persists. Because the, 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 the conspiracy of the rulers wants people not to think about themselves, but to look at an external enemy as all their problems. And if you do that, the person doesn't do any introspection on their own life. They don't look at how they missed the mark. They don't look at how they fail. They think their problem is external when Jesus is telling all of us, your problem is not just external, your problem primarily is internal. I have to solve the internal problem in you before I can even give you the kingdom. Because you're not fit for the kingdom. 
in the state that you're in. If you want a kingdom where there's holiness and righteousness and I'm ruling and reigning with a rod of iron and you want the animals to be nice and you want it to be returned back to the Garden of Eden, I have to fix you first. You just can't walk, walk into the kingdom in your state. That's what Israel doesn't understand. And, but that happened from the conspiracy of the rulers. Look, if you don't think you're the enemy... If you don't see how you're contributing to the catastrophe that's going on around you, if you don't see your own sin in this, then why do you need Jesus? You just need Jesus to take care of Joe Biden? No, because that's the same mentality. Then they only saw Jesus as taking care of Rome. They didn't see any need whatsoever for Jesus for them personally. So when they're saying, Hosanna, they're saying it with that kind of mindset. They're not thinking, they're not personalizing this. Oh, you see how clever Satan is? Give them a utopia where they never have to change. Give them a kingdom where that you can walk in there and you can just be how you are. And we'll change the environment to create utopia. Look, that, that's backwards. That's backwards. We have to change the person before we put them in the new environment. It's backwards. So again, what they were looking for, deliverance, physical deliverance, that Messiah would do this. That's, that's all that's happened. That's how they're mistaken. That's why they're jumping to the Feast of Tabernacles. Will Messiah do this one day? Of course he will. I mean, for goodness sakes, he comes back and it's a bloodbath. He kills the Antichrist, false prophet. He kills the armies. There's uh, blood after the horse's bridle, 200 miles uh, uh, square. I mean, he comes back and slaughters. There's no doubt about that. That's what they wanted that, then. But you can't have that until you're ready. So Israel must be saved first spiritually before they can be saved physically in the second coming. That's the order. So, so, so here's the thing. Prophetically, here's the seven feasts. Notice them. You have a spring and a fall set of, of, of high days for Israel. Notice in spring, you have Passover, which is, that's what he's doing now. He's presenting himself as a Passover lamb on day 10, right? So he's going to be crucified on Passover. Then after that, unleavened bread, which is Saturday in the tomb, and his body doesn't see decay, right, as as predicted. And then you have Feast of first fruits, which is resurrection Sunday, okay? So that happens within a short period of time. And then later on, Pentecost is where the, the church is birthed, obviously. Uh, this, is what, this is the day of the giving of the law, but then also this is a, a new entity that's beginning in Pentecost. Well, guess where, so guess where we're at right now? We're not in the fall. We're in the, sum, the church age is in the summer of harvest, summertime before harvest. That's where we're at. And I think we're getting close to, obviously, the fall feast, right? I think you know, when you see Israel, you know, getting their temple ready and stuff, you're looking at close to trumpets, atonement, and tabernacle. Notice where tabernacle is, or Sukkot is, compared to Passover. Dude, you're in a fall feast, right? You're, we're, you're off target. Everything has to be done in order. And the order, even look at the fall. Before you have tabernacles or the kingdom what must happen to Israel? Number one, the trumpet. That's related to the rapture, by the way. That will signal to Israel, get your act figured out. Atonement is when Israel finally does accept the Messiah late into the tribulation. And they do get saved spiritually. And then tabernacles when it's second coming, where he comes back to rescue them physically and then it establishes the kingdom. But notice the order. You can't, you have to have trumpets and atonement before tabernacles. Everything must be done in order. So here's what starts happening. And some of the Pharisees called for him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said, if I tell you these should keep silent, the stones would cry out. I am the Messiah, but you're misinterpreting everything. Notice what he said. Now, as he drew near, he drew to the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known even especially in your day the things that make for your peace, what peace? What peace is he talking about? If you would have known, he's not talking about peace among the nations. That will happen later. 
personal peace between you and God. But now they are hidden from your eyes because you've rejected me. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side. And level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in one, uh, you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. You did not know what I was here for. You wanted me to take care of the Romans, but I'm here to save your souls. And because of that, you committed the unpardonable sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and in 70 AD, the judgment came on Israel. The temples destroyed, Jerusalem's destroyed, and 1.2 Jews are killed at that time. And when you go to Israel today, and you go to the western side of the western wall on the southern end, here's what you see. Not one stone left on another. It collapsed the city, or sorry, the street of the city. You can see where it caved in the pavement. Those stones have been there since 70 AD. As a testimony to Israel, you missed it. Now, Israel won't miss it in the future, but they missed it then. And then even the children are, 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 are saying, uh, Messiah. But the chief priests and scribes saw wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna, son of David. They were indignant and said to him, do you hear what these, these are saying? And Jesus said to him, yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants? You have perfected praise. So even he welcomes worship. He's allowing them to worship him, which is, they, they get that. They just don't get his function. And then he goes on. Jesus said, have you never read the scriptures? Now, wait a second. This is important. Where does Hosanna come from? What did I say? Psalm 118. Have you never read the scriptures? You know what he says right here when he quotes the stone the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This is what the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. Guess where he got that from? Psalm 118. Thank you very much. He's like, you're quoting to me the messianic greeting. Haven't you read the rest of that psalm? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone or the cornerstone. What do you mean? He explains it. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing its fruits. What nation? The church? The church? No, the church is not a nation. A future Jewish nation in the future will accept Jesus as the Messiah. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken. Notice the contrast. But who, on, on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Wow, that doesn't sound very nice, Jesus. That doesn't, that's, that doesn't sound like tiptoeing through the tulips. That's right, because this is the real Jesus. Let me explain what he is telling Israel. Look, you got an option here. As Psalm 118 said, the stone the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So you can, you, you can either reject me or accept me. If you reject me, then the stone falls on you and crushes you to powder. If you accept me, you will what? You will fall on the stone... You'll be humbled because you have to admit your need, your spiritual need for me. But then that stone will become your foundation. But either way, there's no middle ground. You either accept me or you reject me. Huh. So here's the truth. Before the kingdom is experienced, change in the individual must occur. The reality of the person must change before entering in this new reality of the kingdom. He had this discussion with Nicodemus, didn't he? It's, it's all there. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. There it is, right there. You're not getting in the way you are. You can't. You need me to save you. You need me to change you. Nicodemus, you must be born again, which means you must be regenerated because inside you, your spirit is dead. So I have to regenerate you for even making you fit to get in. Now, one more thing. You say, well, I have accepted Christ. I have, uh, I, I have been born again. Great, now you're in the kingdom. And one day you will get that entrance into the messianic kingdom. Great. But that's not the end of the day. That's not the end of the story. That's just the beginning. Your experience in the kingdom, your rewards, your privileges, the authority, the roles you will have in serving Christ in that kingdom is all dependent on you now. 
and how you walk with him right now. So you're, just because you got in doesn't mean that's it. I, I don't need to do anything else. Now it's about how will you experience that kingdom? How will you deal with that kingdom? Because here's what's happening. And I want to I point this right on the bottom shelf to all of us. All of us are going through junk. There's junk with our family. There's junk in our jobs. There's junk in our life. And it's a mess. If you're not careful, you will come under the same temptation that Israel did. Make one thing your enemy, external from you, outward from you. Well, if I just had a better job, Brandon, I would have paradise. If I had a better spouse, I would have paradise. If I had a better school I went to, it would be paradise. You do that, you fall under the same trap that Israel fell under because you externalize your problem. Here's the thing. What Jesus is trying to say is to make you fit for this kingdom, number one, you have to be born again, but number two, you can't stay the way you are. You have to change and you have to become different. You're not fit for it right now. So all the junk I'm allowing into your life is to create the ability in you to live in that kingdom. You are practicing right now for living in that age. Everything you're experiencing will be used in that kingdom. But if you get bitter and, and resentful that you don't like your life and you want to externalize and say, all my problems are located to Joe Biden. All my problems are located to my spouse. All my problems are located to my adult kids that are crazy or whatever it is, whatever you name. If you externalize it, you're not admitting what you're contributing to your own hell. You have to admit that you're contributing to your own problems, that the majority of your problems come from you. And if you're not willing to do that, you're not getting fit or set up for the kingdom. That's what Jesus is trying to tell us. Yes, there is coming a day where there's holiness and righteousness and the animals return back to what they were. There is coming that day. And he's saying, I need you to get ready for it. I need you to personalize it and do some introspection because I need you changed. And don't forget this. When we do get there, it's forever. It's forever. So whatever you're going through right now is preparing you for eternity. Embrace your cross. Embrace the burden now because it's making you a fit citizen for the kingdom. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for what we can learn from Palm Sunday. Amazing what happened. Wow, what a turn of events. Help us not to be like that. Help us to, to focus on ourselves and fix our own problems. Take the log out of our own eye before we try to fix the world. And Father, I pray if there's anyone that here that doesn't, hasn't entered the kingdom through your son, they would do so today, that today the day would be the day of salvation. They would get their entrance into the kingdom, understanding Christ died for them on that cross and was buried and rose on the third day to give eternal life and entrance into the kingdom if they would only believe. Bless us now as we go. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Hey, if you're new, I want to meet you over here. If you want to know more about Christ, our pastors are up here. They'll tell you more about him. God bless you.